Todd Worden, the TOS guy. Welcome to our next live stream. We have a special guest today, a first time visitor. Before we start, I'd like to remind everybody, please subscribe. That helps the algorithm, I've been told. Click like as many times as you like, although I'm sure only one will be accepted. And make sure you follow us on all our social media so we keep raising awareness of TOS. Our talk today is with a good friend of ours, Rob Hagen. Rob is a plastic surgeon of all specialties, specialized in peripheral nerve surgery, working in St. Louis, Missouri. And Rob has a really unique approach to TOS, which carries a tremendous amount of value, in my opinion. You're going to find out exactly why that is. We're also going to try a different kind of approach. Rob has a great presentation, but I'm going to stay on with him, and I'm going to poke him and prod him with little questions and discussion points as we go along, because Rob and I have discussed TOS many times. Isn't that right, Rob? Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for, coming to our, thanks for coming to our show. I'm really looking forward to your talk. As you as you know, you and I, this keeps clicking off. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll try to continue watching uh, to make sure I don't go on mute. But um, you and I have enjoyed multiple, multiple discussions about TOS. And, um, and hopefully today will just be maybe a summary of all those discussions in the past. Um, I've, I've brought some slides that, uh, that again, uh, you have uh, been willing to, to stay on and, and, uh, and prod me a little bit about some of them. And hopefully that'll, um, again, give us a, additional fodder for ongoing regarding this topic. Um, Herb, that, that mute button still keeps clicking over, so I don't know if we can we can work on that, but uh, um, so as Scott said, I'm a peripheral nerve surgeon and we wanted to talk today kind of uh, via our optic of, of, of thoracic outlet through the eyes of a, of a peripheral nerve surgeon, right? Most of the time, um, you know, a, a person addressing TOS is a vascular surgeon, but um, you know, I'll, I'll summarize today why uh, why my particular interest in, in neurogenic thoracic outlet evolved over time. And as you can see, I, I'm a plastic surgeon trained. I did a um, hand and microsurgery fellowship. Um, I did a craniofacial fellowship as well. All that training kind of serendipitously um, prepared me to be a, um, a peripheral nerve surgeon kind of head to toe um, with uh, one of my focal specialty areas being uh, the neurogenic uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. As you can see, this is a spectrum of my practice, uh, hand surgery, peripheral nerve, do some reconstructive surgery, a lot of surgical pain management kind of solutions, which is a, a lot of the peripheral nerve problems. And we even integrate some um, biologic and regenerative kind of uh, techniques into, into, um, into our uh, process as well. You know, when you think of uh, peripheral nerve injuries, you know, just the, the basic things are, right, you can cut a nerve, you can crush a nerve, a nerve can be compressed, or you can have a ner uh, nerve neuroma. And I just share this with just kind of, let's, let's paint a big picture about uh, peripheral nerve surgery, right? Carpal tunnel is the most common compression neuropathy uh, that we know. But in reality, neurogenic thoracic outlet is actually a, a uh, compression neuropathy in its own right. Um, the predominant component of it is, is just that. Um, we, as peripheral nerve surgeons, can use, we can, if a nerve is compressed, we can decompress it, right? If it's damaged and, um, and it's a sensory nerve, we can excise it. I always say if it's doing more harm than good, you can get rid of it. Um, you can repair nerves, unlike the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system re repairs itself, right? And so when we do a nerve repair, um, it can grow back down that same conduit and, and um, re innervate uh, skin and or muscle. Um, and then we can transfer nerves, much like old tendon transfers, we can now use uh, nerve transfers. So that just gives you an idea about what is in the tool belt of, of the uh, peripheral nerve uh, surgeon. Rob. And I just let them... Yeah. Hey, Rob, to go back one step, you talked very briefly about a compression neuropathy. And this is something you and I have discussed. Can you describe, can you define how you approach a compression neuropathy in theory and give a couple examples? 
Sure. I mean, again, a compression neuropathy is a pinched nerve, right? And and again, the most common uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, tarsal tunnel syndrome, all of those are, um, are compression neuropathies, um, compression of the lateral femoral nerve at the groin, neuralgia parasitic, compression neuropathy, right? Um, you, there's a, there's a kind of a standard logical approach to each one of those and diagnosing it. Sometimes it involves, um, just clinical examination and history, right? Every, t every time we are as a peripheral nerve surgeon, see something, we look at what was, what was the mechanism of injury? What are the symptoms? What are the distribution of the symptoms? What are the, what's the physical examination show us? What are the ex other additional testing show us? MRA, MRI, electrodiagnostic, ultrasound, and then um, and then diagnostic injections. And so that's that logical stratified approach to each one of these, whether it's carpal tunnel or a complex neurogenic thoracic outlet, is is kind of how we approach that. Is that is that answering that question? So so by considering a compressive uh, neuropathy, which occur in traditional places throughout the body, whenever the nerve goes through a tight tunnel. It's not everybody who considers neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome as just another example of that disease, maybe a more complex one, but yeah. you do. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, that's part of its pathology uh, for sure. I mean, again, you have to, you have to look at some of the, uh, the arterial stuff that we're going to talk about. You know, you can have a regular um, non-aneurysmal vascular, you know, structure um, that is still getting kinked or compressed. Right. And the evolution of our technique uh, um, we spend a fair amount of time just uh, doing what we call not just the neurolysis, but the arterial lysis of, um, you know, at that scaling triangle. And so we can, we can talk more about that as we, as we Good. Uh, continue Thanks. on. Great question. Thank you. Um, just a little thing about pain because, you know, the, the number one thing that usually drives people in uh, for neurogenic thoracic outlet is their pain, right? Uh, whether it's an occipital headache or facial pain or neck pain or pain in their extremity or pain in the back. So from my standpoint as a peripheral nerve surgeon, understanding pain and, and kind of embracing, not running away. We were often taught to, to um, run away from pain and, um, and at least chronic pain, right? Um, and it's many times the final limiting factor of people getting, I always talk about getting back to, back to sleep, back to life, back to work. Right. So, you know, those are those are the the ultimate goals uh, for us. And and in peripheral nerve surgery, you can't do that until you get rid of the pain. Right. Um, people can tolerate numbness. People can tolerate some weakness. But when they're not sleeping and they're in chronic pain, um, you've um, and, and you're not fixing it, you're failing this patient. Right. Let's put in perspective um, the. TOS, right, neurogenic TOS, in the whole complex of the upper upper extremity and arm, right. We when when I'm a, when I'm seeing and evaluating neurogenic thoracic outlet, I'm also looking at all the other nerve compressions in the upper extremity, right. So we we're often evaluating is this coming from the spine, right. So we have to rule in rule out if there's any spinal pathology, um, but we also have to rule in and rule out everything downstream from the plexus as well, right? Whether it's pectoralis minor syndrome, whether it's radial tunnel, pronator syndrome, you know, carpal tunnel, all that, because if you don't address that and, and, and let's say you even do your TOS surgery, right? You treat that, but you still have a numb hand and, and painful hand and you, you missed carpal tunnel or you missed a pronator syndrome, right? So comprehensively understanding the whole limb um, and all, all, peripheral nerve compressions outside of the, of the, of the spinal axis is, um, I think, um, uh, value added importance. Not to mention multiple crush syndrome. Right. And that's what that would be, right? I mean, if you had a pronator syndrome and a cubital tunnel syndrome and you had thoracic outlet, um, that's a, you know, that's a, a, a multi-level crush, right? Um, and, and it happens more than you think, right? We're often diagnosing these distal compressions as well as the NTOS and then having to decide, okay, which one are we going to do first, right? Because, you know, it's, and it's often confusing to parties involved 
that are trying to dictate care for these uh, individuals, right? And do you uh, find that sometimes you treat the more proximal neuropathy and you don't have to treat the distal ones after that? In some, yeah. So if we can prove to ourselves that we think more of the symptoms are emanating from uh, from proximal, we'll do proximal first, right? Um, if it's if it's more confusing or we think that, you know, it, that it's more from the distal, we'll focus distal, we'll do the compression of the distal, and then we're, we're back to like, okay, let's try some um, injections and therapy on that more proximal pathology than MTOS. Um, every pathway exists. You just got to find out which, you have, I always say, we have to be patient-centric. We have to, we have to customize care to every single one of those patients so that we can um, get the best outcome for them. Right. It's not about us. It's about them. Right. So a lot of a lot of fun to discuss that. Right. Sorry, a little coffee action. Um, you know, this I, I put this in there because we all know, like when we start talking about thoracic outlet syndrome, we all know that 95 percent of them are neurogenic. Right. Small percentage of venous and even a smaller arterial. Right. Doesn't mean that those structures aren't involved in the scaling triangle. And we'll talk about that. But a large number of these um, are, are neurogenic. And it, like we said, it's a nerve compression. And so we have to figure out that. And that's what got me interested. When I, as, as my peripheral nerve practice was, was um, evolving very early in my practice, I, I started to ask the question about when, when, when I understood that 95% of these were or neurogenic, I'm like how come how can we have peripheral nerve surgeons that aren't more involved in this, um, and that the vascular surgeons were largely taking care of these patients, and I just thought, hey, we're bound to have a different optic and and maybe some help in improving overall stratified and longitudinal care for these patients. So that was a bunch of years ago. <laughs> so that's a great, that's a really great point, Rob, which I've discussed with many patients and other docs. I'm glad you brought it up. This is a very complex anatomic area. A lot of surgeons are hesitant to go there because there's so many important structures. But over time, vascular surgeons have kind of taken the lion's share of the knowledge of it, as it were. And and they and, and made good contributions to this problem, right? Yep, um, but it's just, based on a minority of the disease. Yeah. So right. they, they approach neurogenic the same way they would approach a subclavian artery aneurysm. And right. maybe maybe that leaves open a lot of possibilities because it is a different disease with many causes. Right. And I think our challenge has been to suggest that maybe a little more stratified care model might be appropriate. Um, and uh, we've been working, working long and hard on that. Um, I put this in here because I think you know, often when I'm talking to, uh, to other uh, clinicians, other providers about, you know, well, I don't, they say, I don't really see it that often. And I say, well, even in my practice, look, I mean, here's a list of how these patients have presented to me, you know, just generalized trauma, whiplash, they've been accosted, they, they're the generic headache patient that shows up in my clinic, you know, they presented it with carpal and carpal and cubital and and um, lateral epicondylitis and and generalized shoulder pain. You know, so these patients are out there, and part of our burden as as uh, TOS providers, right, is that we have to help them identify uh, triggers to understand, like, okay, no, 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 that actually might be a TOS patient because the MRI of the shoulder is pretty negative, the spine's negative, and but they've got a, uh, you know, they got shoulder pain, they've got limb uh, numbness and tingling. So, you know, there's a couple things that we can we can um, help them identify these these patients. Um, the TOS uh, team, you know, often includes the shoulder surgeon, the C-spine surgeon, the physiatrist, the neurologist, the radiologist, right? Um, so those are common dialogue, common interactions that. Uh, um, it help identify these patients. Here's kind of uh, the here's kind of the uh, the talk about the historically you know 95 percent of these patients are being are neurogenic and nearly 95 percent or 100 are sent to, to vascular surgeons. And I when I started this out, are, are we doing a vascular surgery for a nerve problem? Um, was just my simple question, right? 
And so over time, our technique, as you know, is, is, has evolved. You know, we tend to focus, um, you know, we're now down to uh, an outpatient surgery that focuses on the composite of, of structures in the scalene triangle and the pectoralis minor in most cases, right? Um, we, five to 7% of the time may remove a rib. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go along. Here's the classic picture. I love this picture. It kind of breaks it down to the three points of the potential compression. Anytime you're talking about neurogenic thoracic outlet, you should uh, think about these um, three sub, uh, I really, really sub diagnoses, right? Uh, you know, scaling triangle syndrome. You have costoclavicular space syndrome. You have pectoralis minor syndrome, right? And <clears throat> we believe, again, that 95% of the time, that addressing scalene triangle and pectoralis minor, um, you will, in the majority of the cases, convert pe people to doing doing much better. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, scalene triangle is is a, is variable in how people think what what's associated with it, right? It's the anterior scaling, it's the middle scaling, it's the first rib, but it's also those structures associated with it. And early on, we adopted, hey, the classic, you know, upper trunk, middle trunk, lower trunk, as you can see here, of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery all within the contents, right? But you'll see, and as we talk a little bit later, uh, also part of that is the dorsal scapter, suprascapter, and the long thoracic nerve. Those are the, all the contents of the, of, um, of the scaling uh, triangle. Costoclavicular um, component here, uh, first rib and the clavicle. Here's the scaling triangle. Um, the pectoralis minor, right, um, you know, is very dynamic, right? Uh, pectoralis minor inserting into that coracoid process. I still, to this day, it's so consistent that the pec minor is involved and it's so consistent that people are just focally tender over that insertion site. And I don't get how it is that often, right? I, when we when we first started uh, developing our technique, I'm like, surely, I bet, I said, I bet you about 50 to 50, 50, 50 would be, you know, pec minor and not, it's nearly, it's nearly 100%. Um, and now we're just down to di differentiating to determine, you know, what's applying most pressure, <coughs> kinking, what's kinking the artery? Is it the scaling um, when we're provocative move motions? Is it at the scaling triangle or is it the, it's at the pec minor? Um, but clearly <coughs> we're seeing more and more um, even arterial compression at that um, um, pec minor insertion cork. Yeah, it keeps coming off. I don't know why. Um, okay. So this brings up a great point. Oh, lost your audio. There you go. So, and then just real quick on the ana ana anatomy, and then we'll, um, one of the real important evolutions that we've had is to, is to release that. There's a dense clavy pectoral fascia that comes down the side of, a, of the pec minor and it can fuse with the coracal brachialis. So you, you really have to make sure and release that or you'll have an incomplete release at the pec minor. And then the other thing we do is we divide that. I have talked about, um, um, you know, about the importance of that subclavius muscle and, a, and that subclavius posticus um, um, morphology or uh, anatomic variant. Um, and I've seen more and more of those um, as we've um, evolved and, and really look at that subclavius muscle as well. So just another interesting uh, point. You were going to make a point, Scott, with the anatomy. I'm yeah, sorry. It's, yeah, it's great that you bring up the pec minor, the scalene triangle. As, as we know from the literature there, are, I catalog these on my website. There's like 26 different names from different authors over 200 years doing different techniques, different provocative maneuvers. We know the anatomy in any single person can be so variable 
that the nerves can take different courses relative to the scaling muscles, that the scaling muscles may overlap and narrow at the bottom where they attach to the first rib, they can form a sling, that we have scaling minimus muscles and other variants. And so your detailed approach to me resonates uh, greatly. And the fact that you have these results with very few rib resections um, is very encouraging to me because the standard, as most of our viewers know, is thoracic outlet syndrome, rib resection. And I don't think uh, it's always that automatic. So that's what we see in the literature. <clears throat> I also want to bring up about the pec minor, and I'm sorry, this is kind of a multi-layered point. Um, the literature for radiology is scant, but it doesn't show that there's compression behind the pec minor. It actually shows that people without disease have a narrower retropectoralis space than people with TOS. And so um, you, I'll ask you a dumb question. Historically, do you know when the first pec minor tenotomy was done? Do you have a wild guess? No, I, I, I mean, I've seen that referenced in, but I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. 1950, a guy named Jerry Lord, who was famous for a lot of yeah. things. And uh, 1950, and, you know, he didn't know why it worked, but you and I both know it works. And we both don't know why. I disagree with the most literature that says the plexus is compressed there. I think it's more likely that there's an imbalance of shoulder muscles and that the pec minor is... Uh, tense, as you notice, very tender. And when you inject a blockade into that muscle, you often get relief of symptoms, I would bet. Lost your audio. We largely do injections, uh, diagnostic and therapeutic injections for, for, most, for most all patients. And you know, we always inject that pec minor. Um, it always contributes. And I, I even went through a period of time where I would inject the pec minor first and then retest them and just see, um, uh -huh. you know, a component, most of them, a component would get better, but then they'd still be tender at their scaling triangle. We'd still have, they'd still have a tenel, you know, so it, but it proved to me that there's still a component to it. And I had to differentiate and, and convince myself um, of their, of their in independent involvement, I guess. Now, now, also, you brought up the clavipectoral fascia. For the viewers, the fascia is like these layers of connective tissue, sort of like thick paper, uh, uh, fibrous tissue between layers of muscles. And the clavipectoral fascia wraps up the pec minor. Mm -hmm. So that association may be treated. I've never met another surgeon who addresses the clavipectoral fascia in every patient. So maybe that's why you have good success. Yeah, well, I think, just like I said, it's part of the tunnel. It, it's it's the composite of all these things that are, that, you know, are adding up and, you know, one plus one plus one is six, you know, on a, on a, <laughs> right. on a, on a bad, in a bad direction. Right. Um, right. So, it, so maybe when you blocked the pec minor muscle, you couldn't get rid of all symptoms because maybe it wasn't the initiating point, but it was a secondary mechanism. I, I don't know. Right. I don't know. And for me, it, it, this is a, again, this is just an offshoot. This is, this is why I love having these discussions with you. You know, you know, I've I've also thought that that releasing that pec minor because it's usually tight. I think people hold their their shoulder. Relieve, hold the shoulder forward and down to relieve some of the symptoms and by releasing that you're allowing that shoulder to come back up into a better position. You're also elevating the clavicle, right, which opens mm -hmm. that costoclavicular space. Um, that in conjunction with releasing the scalings off that first rib, and I'm a believer that that first rib um, uh, drops once you a, a little bit once you once you release the scalings off of it, right? So the composite of raising that clavicle and dropping the first rib sometimes converts people from even if they're in a gray zone of maybe they need a first rib out, but we've opened up the space. Um, I, I think that's meaningful. Great. Those are great points. Um, this is just a slide to show you, you know, again, early on, we'd, we'd be so excited. They come patient, come back in and their arm and their hand would feel better. And then, but they were like, doc, I still got posterior shoulder pain. And I was so frustrated by that. And I couldn't figure out why. And I'm like, well, what nerves are going to there? And so we kind of demarcated out that, you know, the, the, 
middle, uh, the, the kind of the medial border of the scapula is the dorsal scapular pain, scapular pain in general lined up with suprascapular nerve. And then this kind of this generalized from the scapula down into the axilla um, and on the chest wall matched up with the long thoracic um, nerve. When we started adding these in and uh, to our evaluation and ultimately into our surgical treatment, um, largely that posterior shoulder pain started to go away and we were, we were becoming more successful at treating that. Um, I'll see patients that have had, you know, uh, a, a, a TOS surgery and just have, when they have just that posterior shoulder pain, I'm much more open to, to um, you know, evaluating them to see if, if, if that's just what they need. Maybe that perhaps they had a very good, you know, decompression for their traditional TOS but uh, posterior shoulder pain will block these nerves um, under ultrasound. And if they get better, we'll go and neuralize those for them um, as well. So it's kind of- Are they idea. hard to see during your surgical uh, approach? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I'm wishing I wouldn't done, have done it. You know, it's a tough dissection uh, in, in any secondary um, um, plexus or neck surgeon, I would, I would say. But um, we've, we've gotten better at it over the years and- um, uh, we're very selective, but I think those who have had us do it, um, I think would say um, uh, they, they've uh, had significant benefit. So this is another example of where a peripheral nerve surgeon takes a different approach. You're so used to dealing with tiny nerve branches and small nerves and dissecting them along their courses. No audio, Rob. As we talked about earlier, I, I think, you know, I love the old joke. What's the most famous um, fiction book? Grey's Anatomy, right? Um, everybody's <laughs> just enough different. They yeah. have to keep that in mind, right? If you, if, if in order to customize and, and provide um, true, you know, kind of custom care for the individual, um, you have to take into uh, account all the anatomic variability in these nerves. Right. Uh, Which, by the way, if I slap myself on the back is a great reason for doing an MRI. Oh, absolutely. I don't know. You've you've made great contributions in this space. I love your energy about it. I love your database. You understand this as good as anybody I know. And um, um, just love having even this discussion with you. Well, this is so. So we agree on this. Peripheral nerve surgeons take a very, very detailed approach for many problems throughout the body. And, um, you know, as radiologists, part of our job is to understand what the clinician wants. And there aren't many clinicians who I've seen who, who need and demand that high level of detail. But once I understand how you approach this, when we, I remember I met you at the meeting, the peripheral nerve surgery meeting, and <clears throat> it's just great how you guys take so much detail into mind. It's just hard for radiologists because we really have to know that little area in incredible detail. <laughs> well, you've You've done an unbelievable job. So this is just a, this this will kind of put in perspective a little bit of about what I think kind of goes on, right? So in most of these, in the component of injury, when, when, the, when we're looking at TOS, we have scalene fibrosis, right? Which affects the plexus, a traction point of, of those accessory nerves. We just talked about primary pain from traction and elevation of the first rib, right? So traction on the meaning, meaning there's, tethering of that um, um, and and compression on the, uh, the nerve and really the artery, right? The brachial plexus tethering and compression is, we talked about that thickened rind um, earlier on that, um, you know, I believe that comes from probable perineural bleeding, right? And the body resorbs that, but it leaves behind this fibrosis um, that I, I usually call you know, it's, it's kind of like a thickened shrink wrap that acts like a Chinese finger trap, right? Um, the, and you lose the gliding surface. And most people don't think about gliding surfaces of nerves, right? I mean, you, you, the tendons need a gliding surface, nerves need a gliding surface, and, and nerves are very sensitive. They don't, they don't tolerate not having it as, as much as, say, tendons do in the forearm, right? And then we've kind of we've kind of talked a little bit about the the pectoralis minor syndrome, and then um, even um, look, go back. Sorry, there's something right in my way. I can't see there. Um, but the sub 
subclavian artery uh, has been an evolution for us too. The same process that goes on around the nerves actually goes around around the arteries, right? We see this thickened um, fascia around it, and uh, we're we're cleaning that off, much like when we used to do. Like it's almost like a sympathectomy of the artery, right? Um, I've, I've now call it kind of an arterial lysis because I think that fits more appropriate with the uh, neurolysis, right? But we're doing the same thing. We're cleaning that off. Um, and um, and I, I think it's made a, a significant um, uh, difference in, in our outcomes. When we talk about symptoms, you know, one of the, one of the most odd things that, that people forget about is an occipital headache, right? In this old Sanders paper, you know, 76% of people had an occipital headache, right? And we do a lot with occipital neuralgia, but in, in this patient population, they'll tend to have an occipital headache right here. It doesn't tend to activate and come over like classic occipital neuralgia. So that's a lot of, that's the first kind of big picture differentiating we're looking at. We're looking at the pattern of that occipital headache. Um, and, and differentiating because again, many of these patients, not many, some subcategory of these patients have both an occipital neuralgia and a uh, neurogenic thoracic outlet. So when we just look, that's just one symptom, right? But as you know, you can have shoulder pain, periscabular pain, extremity pain, facial pain, ear pain, jaw pain. You can have numbness, tingling, and weakness. <laughs> Of, of that upper extremity in, in any any degree or any distribution, right? So I always, so when I'm talking to other uh, care providers, the shoulder, uh, the physiatrist, the spine surgeon, I'm like, if you're confused by the number of symptoms, right? And the mechanism of injury and all that, it, like start to think about that. Your MRI is negative or you're looking for a soft call on an on a, uh, MRI C-spine and, and your shoulder MRI is negative, but you have all these symptoms. You, you know, you need to look at um, the, the idea of TOS, right? Is that a fair, would you, would you say that's a fair summary? That's a great point. It's like when you can't pin down one radiculopathy and you have these associated things with chest pain, vague things that can't be defined by the territory, occipital pain, right? That should be triggering right. your bells and saying, maybe I should be looking at TOS. And I think most of our patients who view this have had those episodes where they just don't get why they're having all those symptoms together. So I think that's a great point. Your audio is out, but average, but also- Yeah, yeah. The average we, patient that sees us has seen six to seven um, uh, providers before they find us uh, with this diagnosis. It's a shame. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when I first started this 25 years ago, patients were going 10 or 15 years without a diagnosis. And I'm yeah. so glad, thanks to people like you, that it's really been shortened. We're really seeing a change in awareness throughout the country. Well, that's a team effort. I mean, you're, 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 you know, this platform alone um, uh, helps a lot of people. Well, it's uh, what we aim to do. I think patients are now driving this, don't you? You must get some patients to come to you and tell you they have TOS. They do. I just had a patient. I, you know, every day I learn more about, I mean, I'm not a big, I'm a, I'm a fan of, but I'm not a big um Had a, um, we had a uh, young a female who I did headache surgery on that did a, a TikTok on her experience. And it was a great story. She had 32,000 views. We, we, you know, <laughs> her, I said, her impact, she's, she paid it forward. She touched lives of people that wouldn't, other, like, it's just so cool. Um, and, you know, when you see things like that happen, it's well beyond us. We're, we're, Kind of slugging away in the in the trenches here, and for a patient to be that creative and come up yeah. with um, um, platforms and and methods to to get people to the right place is is pretty yeah. cool. I'll, I'll tell um, you, Rob. Some of the questions we get here from our viewers, which you will see, we get some amazingly sophisticated questions. Yeah, people use Doctor Google and they go hunting and they do social media and they find out stuff that's amazing. I absolutely love it. You know, the patient that comes in that's just hyper analytical and is just every patient and they're just asking you just such great questions. I, I'm like, I learn from them. 
um, um, you can never be afraid and never be too proud, right? And um, we we right. all we all have such great access to more information than we can get through. Um, so I just I always say, uh, just keep packing the snowball, man. If somebody gives me some snow, I'm packing it in our snowball. So, great way to put it. Um, all right, let's keep going. You know, you and I talked about just the, the importance of examination. I think, you know, understanding that, um, you know, the the concept of the concept. Can you hear me? Can. Yep. Okay. The concept. So many times I'll see another person have seen. Let's just even say a general neurologist, and maybe they had a general neurology examination. Um, and then it kind of just gets written off that, well, there's no nerve problem because the general neurology examination was negative, right? And, and despite them doing a very thorough and good central neurologic examination, there was no focused physical examination on the peripheral nervous system uh, or specifically the TOS, right? And so I'm often having to, to, politely go back and, and point that out. And, um, um, you know, so examination is important. And, and this, these tests right here are not part of a general neurologic examination, right? I mean, right. these provocative maneuvers that put people in to, to determine, right? Is that, I mean, and these are, these are determining, is that, is that brachial plexus tethered? Like we talked about, is it stuck in, does it have a Chinese finger trap on it? up at the scaling triangle, or is this, is this the, the fulcrum of pressure underneath that coracoid, you know, is, is it evoking and augmenting their symptoms and making it worse, right? This is what we do is for our examination, right? Whether it's the modified upper limb tension test, whether the ECs, the Adsons, the Allen, the right test, the supraclavicular pressure test, we, we look at all of them, the costocavicular maneuver. I use the costocavicular maneuver a lot in, in helping me differentiate um, whether or not that person is, is going to respond to just our soft tissue kind of, um, release versus do we need a, do we need a rib removal? Right. Um, so examination is important. You know, our pro overall protocol, you know, is involves the peripheral nerve consultation. We have a, we have a wonderfully bright, uh, uh, PT person that, um, is um, uh, part of our team. We do an electrodiagnostic test, not to diagnose neurogenic thoracic outlet because it doesn't. Um, we use it to make sure we're not missing something upstream in the cervical spine or downstream, like we talked about, carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, radial tunnel, all these other things that uh, that it may or may not pick up. Um, again, radiologic studies. You're you're the you're the absolute guru on. On MRI, um, uh, I've not found anybody to to provide the detail that, that you do um, on your studies and uh, that are more meaningful. Um, you may even use just basic C-spine X-rays, right? I mean, just to rule in or rule out a, um, um, a cervical rib. Our diagnostic blocks are a big part. If you make it through all the other pieces, and I still think the working diagnosis is a neurogenic thoracic outlet, um, we're we're going to do our own and we've, we've, we've done our own um, ultrasound guided injections since probably about 2008. Um, over the, over the years, we've gotten better and better. And we've talked a little bit about that early on and um, you know, we're, we're now getting both qualitative and um, you know, information as well as being a better injector or diagnostic block. Um, all those things are meaningful in our, in our protocol. Um, so, so to emphasize what you said, if you could go back a second, you got a patient who's had a really nice workup from a good neurologist, including the standard neurologic exam, and you still don't have an answer. This, what you're doing now, provocative tests, all these tests, the East test, the ruse test, the ADSENS, especially the upper limb neural tension test. These are not part of a standard neurologic exam. So it starts because you have an index of suspicion that it's TOS. Right. And then you eventually graduate to these blocks. So I hope people understand that when a doctor tells them you couldn't have TOS, that should be only after they've had a workup as extensive as yours. You know, you're very thoughtful. You're not leaving any stone unturned, but it takes you many tests to eliminate things. 
and to focus down on TOS. So I think there's a great description, a great example for patients about how thorough their doc needs to be before they say it can't be TOS. Right. I mean, we, you know, because we want to be right for the patient. We're not, we're not we're right for us. We'll be right for the patient. What feels good is to, to establish an, an accurate diagnosis, right? And, and, and then go, and if we're going to, um, if we're going to recommend surgery, we want to have the highest index of suspicion that we can, that we can achieve at least for them, uh, uh, that they're going to be a responder. We're not a hundred percent, um, but, um, we're trying to be right. And so all these things, each one of these things is meaningful and thoughtful. And it's over, it, it, it's within that, remember we talked about the, the process of, of every time I'm looking at onset or mechanism of injury, I'm looking at the symptoms, I'm looking at the distribution of the symptoms, I'm looking at the focused physical examination. If, if then we have a, um, still think that that's the diagnosis, we then move on to more additional studies and other consultations to, to further confirm that. If those also support that, we then go to more than more times than not is the diagnostic injections, which have um, both diagnostic and in, and as our practice has evolved and I'm seeing patients earlier and earlier, um, sometimes as early as, you know, six, 10, 12 weeks after the injury that can cause that, mm -hmm. all of a sudden those diagnostic injections have a very significant potential therapeutic uh, component to them. That's great. And, um, so do, that's do you, been a lot of fun to show that the earlier we see those patients, um, we may be obviating um, surgery. So that's a value of awareness. If patients know or docs in your community know and they suspect TOS, they get them to you quickly and mm -hmm. the outcome is hugely different. It is. Yeah. Do you do, you do hydro dissections at all? Have you read about them or do you do them? Yeah, no, no, no. We um, uh, most times when we're doing that, I'm hydro dissecting, and, and again, this is an evolution. Remember, we've been doing this um, since about, to, like I said, 2008. So we've we've gotten better and better and better. Uh, I mean, at this point in time, I'm usually hydro dissecting upper trunk, middle trunk, and lower trunk. I, I've hydro dissected the lower trunk off the scalene artery, right, and, wow. and pop that plane open. Um, so if we can are you able describe to, do to that, people what that is? I know we're using medical words, but what's that for our viewers? Can you describe what a hydro dissection is? Yeah, it's just so if you have a, a plane, a plane that's normally moving or has some level of space or has some fat in it, right, um, and it's scarred down or stuck, and you you get your needle into the into that space or potential space, and you inject fluid, say one percent lidocaine, and it pops that plane open, right? You've hydro dissected it with fluid, right? So that's a, we use that around nerves quite frequently. And if we're able to, and then when you look at it on a cross section within the, um, uh, within the ultrasound screen, um, you'll see a, it's kind of like a halo around that nerve, mm -hmm. right? And, and then in that halo, what we'll, we'll do is come back through and put a little, put a little steroid um, in, in that halo, right? Um, and in some cases, we'll actually inject a little structural fat graft in there um, hmm. um, in very unique cases. So uh, but that's a whole nother topic. But, Excellent. Um, yeah. Good. Should we move on? Yeah, I'll just bring up one more thing about that. I have met a few people who will use things like 50% dextrose. <laughs> just recently, I heard about somebody I have not spoken with this doc yet who uses high alluronase. But mm -hmm. the, the idea is what you've discussed before about the nerves not being able to glide because of scar tissue. And then this is one way, a non-surgical way to try to reverse that. So it's yeah. fascinating to me. It's really fascinating. I'd love to talk more about the details. Yeah, well, let's talk more about it because I like that idea. I mean, it's the same. It's kind of, are you, you know, are you digesting or softening that fibrosis and reestablishing, you know, and steroid does that a little bit, right? I mean, steroid helps dissolve um, and, and decrease, um, some, some of that sticky fibrosis. Um, but there's potential uses for other, other, um, um, agents. I think I've done PRP myself, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not, not often enough to be, make any good judgments about it, but the same idea, we're still trying to figure out some of those bioactive substances. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a fan of the biologics and, and, um, 
you know, when you're utilizing, you can utilize PRP, you can use bone marrow or BMAC, you can use uh, structural fat grafting. You know, fat has the most stem cells in it than, than all three of those. You know, oh. the stromovascular component of, of fat is, is loaded with stem cells. Oh. And, and we think that there, there's a good, what we call a paracrine effect, right? And just for everybody listening, paracrine, like if you put stem cells in an area, it's they're spewing out or emanating little signals and, and healing factors that uh, help induce healing and, and good tissue growth. So just the paracrine effect alone of, of those cells being in the area of the injury or what you're trying to change um, is, has proved to be very, um, very beneficial. We work closely with a, a group called Blue Tail Medical here in St. Louis. Dave Crane, who I have a lot of uh, admiration for, ha has taught me a lot um, about uh, biologics over the years. And um, we've tried to apply that to nerves, especially these, these tough nerve cases we're seeing with scar tissue and neuralgias. And, and we don't know that, you know, just blasting back in with surgery is going to, um, is going to help. So we, we've tried to, again, keep that in our tool belt as, as part of it. Um, Great. One of the reasons we recommend patients to see you and reach out. Uh, yeah. At this point, I'm just going to interrupt briefly and remind people subscribe or hit the like button for us. Please help us out. All right. Let's go on to our imaging and whatever we're doing next. Well, I just put this here as a space marker, right? Just to and we've really talked a little bit about already what your your contributions have, have been to helping us and everyone else differentiate um, um, you know, uh, what's going on with the, the nerves and the, um, uh, the muscle tissue and the anatomic variants, uh, th this will continue to prove to be so important, I think. And just in the evolution of all of ours, um, no matter what we're, what technique or approach you're using it, um, your contributions in understanding how well we can see that, I think will push yeah. everybody forward. Um, you know, ultrasound, ultrasound, we kind of talked about, again, I, I've been doing it since 2008. Um, we do all of our own injections. Um, you know, we, we block and inject the anterior scaling, the middle scaling. You can see here, like there's the trunks, right? And you can imagine getting the needle in between the muscle, this fascial plane here and the nerve. And if you can push fluid in there and pop that open, then you have a nice plane to put some steroid um, in there as well. Um, I, I think that's been beneficial. And I think we, um, to this day, convert some patients that were on the surgical pathway and obviate surgery and get them down a pathway of, of, um, of non-surgical treatment, uh, which we're quite proud of. So how much time do we have? Just um, We're good. We're good. We keep going as long as people want to watch us. Good, good. So conservative therapy, right? We talked a little bit about physical modalities, physical therapy modalities, medication, blocks and steroids. We've kind of covered those. I, something that is growing in our practice, and especially since we are seeing somebody, some of these patients earlier, right? I think Botox is um, a very useful tool. If if they're, how to say they had a, a whiplash whatever, 12 weeks ago, and they're just, things are not calming down. They've got that tight, tense, achy feeling, um, and they responded well to a, a, an injection, right? Then we'll, we'll interject to the idea of, of, of Botoxing, that anterior scaling, the middle scaling, and actually, I have anterior scaling muscle there now. We, we'll, we'll anterior scaling, middle scaling, and the pec minor, and to really kind of let those things um, um, kind of loosen up and, and not be so uh, kind of spasmy, so to speak, right? So those are some basic conservative things that we'll do. Whether it's worthwhile talking about indications for surgery, intractable pain, failed supervised physical therapy programs, significant neurologic deficit and persistent symptoms after more distal decompressions. And that's an interesting one, right? Because sometimes we had this discussion a little bit earlier off, 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 offline when, you know, when there's 
distal decompressions. I guess we did. We actually did cover that, didn't we? When yeah, we were talking looking at the arm, right? Yeah. Just whether or not you're doing distal versus proximal and, and, and trying to differentiate um, what, which one you're going to do first, right? So all those things come into play when we're thinking about doing that. So I think that one of the one of the topics I think you you and I wanted to cover today was no rib resection, right? So it's not that we don't do any rib resections, right? It's just we go back to that that whole idea of if are we doing a vascular surgery for a nerve problem, right? Can we stratify our surgical care better? and still get the same or better outcomes, right? And that was, that was the question. And there was literature. I mean, we're not, the, we're not the novel person to say, hey, no rib resection, you can still treat. But there was enough literature that made sense to us to say, hey, like if there's no true costoclavicular component to this, how come we can't just treat the soft tissue components and see, if, see what our outcomes are? And we believe that 95% of the time, about 95% of the time, that that's, that's going to be, let's even say it's 90. Let's even, let's even say nine times out of 10, you don't need to remove a rib. It's not a hundred percent of the time. And, and so, and we do primary rib, uh, first rib resections, right? Um, if we, if it's clear to us that the costoclavicular component is significant enough, or if it's the primary problem, we're going to go take the rib out, right? Um, but if not, if we, if we can't prove that, we're probably going to um, do the scaling triangle plus the pectoralis minor um, at first and, and see if we get to, you know, convert them into doing okay, right? What does that mean? And I, how I present that to patients is, you know, maybe as high as 5% of the time, you're you're going to have to have a second surgery uh, to remove the second or the first rib. And we do that through a transaxillary approach. Um, most people are willing to bet that they're going to fall into the 95%. I would, I mean, that's how I designed it. Uh, that's how I would do it. Right. So we're just trying to be thoughtful um, and, and polite discussions about, Hey, let's stratify care better um, in the, and the nerve related one, right? If, if you have an aneurysmal, you know, artery or, you know, uh, Paget Schroeder vein, yeah, like that, that rib is likely the fulcrum and needs to come out, right? There's no, there's no doubt about that. The, the question here is what is the true percentage of ribs need to come out in neurogenic thoracic outlet? And people don't, not enough people ask that question. Yeah, we don't have the answer for that right now. So, so what you're showing here, if you go back a second to the graph, is the results from doing a rib resection. And I'll just reinforce to people, after surgery, it's about 85% of people feel better. And I think the literature generally agrees by two years, about 70% of people are better. So we're failing in 30%. So um, there are many reasons why that could be. I don't think it's because surgeons don't know what they're doing. I think surgeons are really good at taking out the first rib. But I think... My opinion is we have a very heterogeneous disease here. And as Rob is saying, you know, the first rib is not the cause of disease in many of these patients. So that reflex of thoracic outlet syndrome equals rib resection, I believe needs to be rethought. And that's really the gist of your talk, if I could phrase it in short words. Yeah, if I could inspire all of us to think about that and, and help us get to a, a more definitive answer, that would be great. So the right. fact that you're having success with these other methods that obviates a rib resection is a good sign. Yeah, right. We're um, we're excited about it. So just it's a brief summary, kind of what our um, what our technique is. You know, as it developed over time, neurolysis of the plexus, subtotal anterior scalenectomy. We do a middle scalenectomy release off the entire rib. Um, we decompress the subclavian artery, which is, you know, you heard me say is more of a, a, a now as we call it a, uh, arterial lysis, like the neurolysis of the, of the brachial plexus. Um, we neurolyse and identify every single time the dorsal scapular nerve, long thoracic nerve and suprascapular nerve, as well as release the pec minor and the subclavius and this clavipectoral fascia. When we're doing just this one, we've, 
we do this as an outpatient surgery. It's the first uh, first case of the day. We watch people three to four, three hours afterwards. That's um, great. And, and, and people do great, right? Uh, when we do, do a first rib resection, we do it at the hospital. They, they stay 23 hour observation and go home the next morning. So, uh, so just as a comparison of differentiation born out of, of, um, some earlier collaboration with some, um, friends at the mass general hospital, uh, Kyle Everlin, who is a, just a wonderful, uh, peripheral nerve surgeon, MGH and a dear friend. Uh, came out and visited to to learn peripheral nerve, and um, he was really really excited about our technique, and went back uh, home to to Boston um, uh, in the city that I trained as well, and uh, started utilizing this technique. And we looked at um, looked at our technique and published this paper um, um, uh, jointly uh, to kind of establish what we do. Uh, there's 25. There's actually 25 steps um, uh, that we that we outline uh, in this in this paper. So I always give caution. I, I talked to Scott and Herb and asked if I should show some interopter pictures and just and I think the 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 idea is just to show some of the details, some of the anatomic variation, right? Um, and I think that um, we're happy to share some of these pictures. Um, just to have fun with that. And, and after this, we'll get to our questions and answers for everybody yeah. who's watching right now. Okay. Um, the vert what I sh always show this picture because this is after getting down several layers and, and cleaning off, uh, some of the, the, the more superficial fascia. You see this, this is the upper trunk of the, um, brachial plexus. You look in the books and it's spread out you know, from side to side, right? It's all very nice. It's not like that in here. It's almost vertical. Um, so this is kind of the first thing you see. You see the anterior scaling here. This is the phrenic nerve. Um, you have to protect that phrenic nerve. You have to get in there. You have to remove this anterior scaling. You have to clean off the entire brachial plexus. The middle scaling is behind, right? So this is just kind of early picture of what you see. But um, when, we're, when I'm talking to surgeons, I always say, you yeah, know, it's vertical, not side to side. Now here it looks like more side to side, right? This side is medial. This side is towards the arm over here. Um, but you can see the amount of, of, of what we've done uh, and cleaned this off. Here's that upper trunk. You had a little window of upper trunk here, right? <laughs> the anterior scaling was here. Um, you know, here's C5, here's C6, here's C7, here's 8 and T1 to make up the lower trunk. And here's Here's the artery. And this will give you a little bit of a picture of like, you see this artery and you see this kind of rippled stuff up here. We haven't cleaned that artery off yet. Um, we clean that off and you release that, um, uh, that artery to, uh, and, and there's a profound difference between pulse pressure and pulse when you see it, once you release the anterior scaling off there, then once you, um, once you're able to, um, release and do the arterial lysis. And even, I don't know if you can appreciate this, but this is the dorsal scapular artery that we had to uh, ligate. And if you see how thick this is here, and then how it almost, you can appreciate an hourglass appearance in, in that, um, that uh, nerve, that, that dorsal scapular artery is compressive, often to both the lower and the middle, on this one, it was just the lower. And Scott, you and I have talked about that uh, anatomic variation where I think if if it's tight across here and the ar and that artery goes directly into the middle scaling, it's further tethering that. Yep. Uh, and so that anatomic yep. difference is just one subtle little thing that we look at. For sure, if I see that that's tight and it's going into that middle scaling instead of going out and around it, I, I ligate it for sure. Um, and there's just all these little subtle things um, and anatomic variations that you have to, to recognize uh, in order to get op in order to optimize and individualize um, uh, surgical care for these individuals. Hey, Rob, we're an hour in, so I'm going to suggest we go to okay. questions and answers. Yep. Let's do it. Uh, we show your slide at the end so people know how to contact you through Neuropax. 
Um, okay, so is- Rob is in St. Louis, the Neuropax Clinic. Anybody who doesn't know how to reach him can find him easily on the web. Just reach out to us and we'll put you in touch very easily. And Herb, if you would throw up some of our questions, I want to remind everybody that we don't answer specific medical cases here for obvious reasons, but we will try to give you a general answer to your question if it's about your care in particular. So Brad, your first question today, hi. What is your approach with muscle atrophy, CRPS and TOS? And does CRPS presence allow surgery? This is a good question. Right, so chronic regional or complex regional pain syndrome, right? Um, type one or type two. Type one is a centralized or centrally mediated type pain, and type two is a causalgia, right? So, meaning there's an irritated nerve somewhere, right? And I, t- as a peripheral nerve surgeon, I tend to function in type two, right? Because type two, if there's a nerve that's, again, we go back to is it compressed? Is it irritated? Is it, um, you know, neuralgic? Um, w- we can help those nerves. So when you when you talk about CRPS, you have to differentiate. Let's say that you have a diffuse, and and when you talk about it inconsistent or with with TOS, right? So is that pre-surgical or post-surgical, right? And are you um, is it from trauma, and you're trying to decide whether or not you're going to do surgery, or is it post-surgical, and you're trying to decide, and you still have lots of pain and you're trying to decide whether or not um, you're going to do a revision surgery, right? So both of those scenarios exist. Um, And in both cases, the CRPS does not obviate surgery in all cases, right? Sometimes when everything is just so flared, not a good idea, right? Not a good idea to uh, go in and do surgery. You got to use some other modalities to get that pain down, um, block the centralized um, uh, pain somehow and get you to a point where you're not going to flare so bad and be so miserable, right? Um, and I and again, that can happen after trauma as primary or that can happen um, um, post-surgically as well. Is that, you think, Scott, does that answer about, that question? <clears throat> how about if there's muscle atrophy? Does that change your approach? And I presume we're talking about atrophy in the hand muscles. You... That's interesting. So if you have no pain and you have atrophy, that's really late stage, right? So most of the patients that I see with atrophy still have considerable amount of pain and we're surgery. You know, we're, we're offering surgery if, if we believe that's the diagnosis. For the pain, but not to resolve the atrophy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it depends, right? I mean, um, what kind of atrophy, right? I mean, is it atrophy of the deltoid? Is it atrophy of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus? Is it intrinsic atrophy of the hand, right? Depending every bell-shaped curve for each one of those, you know, severities, each one of those muscles, right? Um, and depending on, you know, you can get some of that back, right? I mean, that's um, it really just depends on where you are on that on, on the development of that. Yep. But a lot of a lot of times people will just have they, they're not using it. You know, the, the, the quotes of the patients, my dead arm, my arm that's dying on a vine, my arm that I don't use, my arm that I call the other guy's arm. Right. Huh. Um, that that promotes disuse atrophy. Right. That alone, if a painful limb you're not going to use, you're going to have some level of atrophy alone. That's recoverable. Right. The, if, you, if you're treating that patient, that's recoverable. So I'll reinforce the fact that there are TOS skeptics out there who will say, unless you have a positive EMG and atrophy of your intrinsic hand muscles, you cannot have TOS. And I viewed it as you do, that it's really end stage. It's late in the course of the disease. If you wait for that, you've missed the boat. Yeah. Right. Yep. You, if you wait for distinct atrophy in the hand and a positive uh, um, uh, electrodiagnostic study, you've not done that patient any favors. And and there's very little likelihood of recovery even after successful surgical decompression. So um, so in terms of patient awareness, it's good that they don't give up when a doc tells them that. Um, Brad asks you, how successful are the surgeries for severe neurogenic TOS? And how does, is a good question again, how does that translate 
in normal daily activity and functionality. Well, I mean, again, audio. Any chronic peripheral nerve uh, pain problem we're taking care of, we're we're gonna we get them back to sleep, back to life, back to work, right? And that's our that's our goal. And you know, even for severe NTOS, um, if you're if you're seeing that in an, in a reasonably timely fashion, you should be able to get back to a daily life function for sure. Right. I mean, that's our goal. I mean, if we couldn't do that, I, you know, I don't know that I'd be in this space. <laughs> Good. Excellent. TOS Unbound, who was here last time. Hi, good to see you again. Not to ask a very general question here, but from a surgeon's perspective, is TOS often misdiagnosed as carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel in your experience? It's a good question. Often's a, a pretty highly variable word, but let's say it's not uncommon for us to see uh, patients that have had um, cubital tunnel and carpal tunnel um, surgeries, and they're considering even revising those um, when maybe the true diagnosis was TOS. Um, so um, that's, and that's one of my soapboxes about understanding that whole limb. You know, if you were um, TOS unbound, if you were, if you saw the, that earlier, you know, just about the whole arm and the shoulder and the neck, that's been, um, I think it's just understanding the whole extremity. Um, and, you know, we'll see patients They'll say, well, everything was negative, and but we just figured we'd do those. We did a cubital tunnel and a carpal tunnel just to see if we got any benefit, right? Like, right. It, it, this this happens, and it goes on, and, it, and it's all boring. We're just trying to help, right? And they want to help people out of pain. Um, but, um, but understanding, you know, all of the diagnosis in the chain uh, is very important. And I wonder if this is based on the medical literature. If the question is coming from the medical literature, it's a good one because there are um, there is a decent amount of medical literature on the fact that people who get surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome actually have thoracic outlet syndrome and may not have needed the distal surgery once you relieved the proximal stuff. So it's a great point. People who have had, you know, well, I'm sure you've had patients came to you carpal tunnel syndrome, then carpal tunnel surgery. They did great for six weeks and now they're getting pain. And it's more proximal on top of that. Sorry about the audio, folks. Yeah, no, no, no. We talked about that earlier. Like, they can coexist. It's not uncommon for people to have distal compressions as well as the proximal compression. But right? multiple crush means that the proximal compression makes the nerves more sensitive to even less compression distally. Is that? Yeah. That theory, yeah. M multiple crush. Um, uh, concept is not just multi-level compression, right? It's that it's kind of a chain. Is that, to your point, is that a proximal compression makes the next more distal compression more vulnerable to occur. That's a great way to describe it. Right? Thanks. All right. And same fellow. I think it's a fellow. I have found biceps tenderness to be really common in TOS patients, but not cubital or carpal tunnel patients in my clinic. Uh, TOS Unbound, can you tell us what your, your specialty is? You can do it in a comment. We'll answer this. Um, so have you found biceps, bicipital tenderness, Rob? Yeah, I mean, uh, bicep tenderness is related to the C5 um, in the upper trunk. There's actually a variant of, of TOS that I call, uh, you know, with upper trunk predominance, right? And they tend to have, those people tend to have um, lateral shoulder deltoid pain and biceps pain. Um, and they have weakness there, right? And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that. So. Thank you. Uh, TOS Mound is an exercise physiologist. So yeah, as I suspected, awesome. a very educated uh, person. Love your um, questions and your and your comments. So. Uh, can you go back to the previous one? I'm an exercise physiologist, and I have found yeah a or point he was raising. There you go. Oh, he's got more questions. Actually, it was something else you were talking about injections. I think. All right, so let's try to unbundle a lot here. There we go. I believe the injections work uh, because the antagonist muscles, like the upward rotators, are weak. 
It's a very interesting point. So you get imbalance of the muscles. Yeah. The, you know, Patty Zorn, our uh, physical therapist is big on that, right? She's uh, the trap, whether, whether it comes primary or secondary, right? We talked about those persons with a lot of that pain take tension, I think, off of the plexus by having it holding it forward and down, right? So that's that that kind of augments the contraction of, of the, the pec minor, weakens the trap. Um, uh, so I, I think she would ag uh, agree with you. And so we work hard on that. We always say it, this is really important. Postoperatively, we can do all that decompression, but if, if they don't get re-strengthen their trap and their mm. posterior shoulder muscles and get it back into the right spot, you, you may not uh, realize the true benefit of the surgery. Uh, T. Austin Bound, that's really good. Do you believe, and you can answer this in a comment, that the upper trap and serratus being weak, do you think that drops the shoulder girdle relative to the rib cage? So you can answer that. And also, do me a favor, reach out to me through my website. Let's have a chat. I'd love to hear more about what you're doing. Okay, we can get back to that. Tim Bits, exclamation mark. <laughs> what are the risk factors for TOS surgery? For someone in his 70s, does it depend on the skill of the surgeon versus uh, many different neurosurgeons? So I'm, I'm guessing, and maybe you can clarify for us whether you're asking how to find what qualities in a surgeon make him or her more likely to be successful. Maybe that's the question. Rob, what would you say are the factors to ask for in a surgeon? Um, well, I would just say is 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 the surgeon focused on on that and they open minded? I think. You know, having a stratified um, care kind of approach is important. Um, you know, I think uh, just being thoughtful in the diagnosis and thoughtful in in the uh, structuring what what the treatment plan is. Are there greater risks for a seventy year old person than there would be for a twenty five year old person beyond the obvious, you know, medical surgical risks? There, I mean, yeah, I mean, just the general surgical risks, right? I mean, every decade that we get older, there's some level of risk that, that increases. You know, I think if if in that age group, and we admit it, I admittedly don't see a lot of 70-year-old um, um, uh, TOS patients for whatever reason, um, but when we do, we're usually, it's more of a postural thing. It's usually that, um, um, that you know, the the posterior shoulder are weak and, um, you know, the scapular depressors um, are tight and, and, you know, that just pulls that shoulder. I say it's sliding off the mountain and puts a lot of change. Mm -hmm. So many times uh, it, when we're seeing a patient of that age group, um, unless it's true trauma induced, um, uh, they're responding well to therapy. And when you talk about stratified care, you're obviously talking about starting out with injections or less serious things and going straight to surgery and having Absolutely. a plan in place yeah. to get relief with lesser degrees of invasiveness. For sure. Okay. Thank you for the question. All right. At 8 PM today, Tim Bits asks again, today's surgeon, Dr. Hagen put up a slide highlighting three areas of nerve concern. One of these is labeled LTN. Does that highlighted affected area include the underarm lymph gland pain? Yeah, so I, again, that was one of the areas that um, early on that would continue to have uh, pain was the posterior shoulder and then how it wraps down around into the into the axilla, particularly on the on the chest wall. And, you know, the long thoracic and that serratus anterior muscle match up with that. And, you know, we know that when a nerve is irritated or compressed or tethered, um, even if it's a motor nerve, that can cause achiness into that um, myotomal distribution, so to speak. Um, so that's um, that long thoracic nerve. It, it, again, we, we identify it every single time, right? We we release that middle scaling and then we um, identify and, and neuralize the C5, 6, and 7 you know, contributions to it. One, to protect it, and two, to treat it. Um, um, so. so the long thoracic nerve, the suprascapular nerve, the dorsal scapular nerve, nerves to the subclavius and pec, the, these are all branches that come off of the brachial plexus in general viewers when I show pictures, when Dr. Hagen shows pictures, 
we look at the five biggest structures, the five nerve roots, C5 through T1, and they form trunks and then they form divisions and cords and nerves. But all along, there are these smaller branches coming off. What Dr. Hagen's describing the long thoracic nerve are branches from each of C5, C6, and C7. And the serratus anterior muscle rides on the first rib and along several ribs here under the armpit, as is being asked by Tim Bitts. And um, so injury to those nerves, or if you've had surgery and the nerves were injured, or if they're being compressed, and it can cause this kind of weird aching, non-localized pain in that area. But when Rob Hagen is describing all the dissections he does, those are very complicated nerves. It's a very complicated network. So um, that's why it's so important to have somebody who's detailed for something like this. Yeah, that long thoracic nerve, I think, is the is the one that you have to like really like be very, very careful as you're. It's quite variable in different patients, isn't it? Right. It's so variable and it's and it's buried within that middle scalene. And it's it's just the one that I really, you know, you're thoughtful through the whole thing. I'm particularly thoughtful in finding those branches for the um, long thoracic and and, uh, cleaning them. Thank you for the question. Tams 1212. My injury is from a car accident. I was T-boned on the left side ugh, and landed upside down 27 months ago. Been off work since. Major pain and muscle weakness. So I'm um, not sure of your question, but car accidents are one of the most common causes of TOS. Uh, what we find, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Rob, is uh, young people who aren't likely to have disc disease they're more likely to end up with TOS after a trauma like this. Once you get about 55 or 60, then the, all the degenerative stuff adds in. Yeah. So the younger people, number one cause of a, a neurogenic thoracic outlet in my patient is is a is either um, a whiplash injury acutely or even remotely, you know, several, many years ago. And by whiplash, we're just talking about the mechanism. Yeah, the mechanism... I mean, she was T-boned and 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 rolled, right? Yep. Uh, there was significant energy in that um, in that accident that was translated to to her body, right? Yep. And um, yeah, I've described this before. Your neck muscles hang on as tight as they can, but your head is usually pretty pretty heavy, and uh, your head is going to rock back and forth, and those muscles are going to clamp down really tight to hold things in place and protect the neck, and they'll get micro tears and they'll swell up. Um, that, I mean, that's well documented that that fibrosis and, you know, that anterior scaling um, uh, right. pathology study uh, that that was uh, that was done showed fibrosis in the anterior scaling after um, after those types of injuries. Right. Sanders did one. And then the docs, I think mock leader did it in L.A. They showed the same thing. That's right. When you look at electron microscope after trauma, those muscles are just structurally different. Yeah, we see that. I mean, visible. Uh, we see it in those muscles as we're releasing it and coming across with the bipolar, it's like, you know, um, it's, they look really tight to you. Yeah, for sure. In certain, in certain patients, we definitely see that fibrosis, you know, you can palpate it. Sometimes you can hear it just as you're coming through the muscle. Sometimes. Hmm. Another reason to get patients to you early. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. A TOS unbound is back. That occipital pain is likely because it is where the upper trap attaches to the skull. Of course, it will be sore when the scapula is downwardly rotated. The upper trap is being stretched. So um, TOS Unbound is saying, you know, these occipital headaches, at least in part, are due to muscle, severe muscle tension pulling on the fascia. Yeah, the no, I agree. that, But they differentiate that, right? So they people will say I have a headache or I have this the hockey stick pain. I call it the hockey stick pain where it's kind of up and down. So I think that description that you're talking about is, is part of that hockey stick pain that, uh, that we often see. So great. great <coughs> comment. Haven't you also written a paper on the little foramen of the little holes in the fascia around the occipital nerves? Hmm. Well, meaning, wait, so we <clears throat> then when those, <clears throat> excuse me, there are little spaces, little holes in the fascia for the nerves to come out to penetrate. Yeah, no, no. So, we, we, you know, part of our practice and overlap. 
or the um uh and but, you wrote a paper on this, right? Yeah, we yeah we, we've we've been looking at occipital neur post um, we look at occipital neuralgia for a long time, so for sure. So if you have these holes in the fascia and you start shearing or pulling on them, they're going to compress the nerves at that point. Yeah, I mean one of the one of the papers you're probably thinking of it. We we looked at the oblique capitis inferioris muscle and in and uh, it's uh, how it's incriminated as the most proximal point of of tethering or compression on the occipital nerve. Um, and really we're looking at that in the context of, of these types of injuries that we're discussing, okay. the whiplash. Thank you for the question or the, the information. I'm a believer. Hi, can AFib, that's atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and other arrhythmias and lower extremity weakness be contributed to a diagnosis of neurogenic or venous TOS? So let me separate those. Have you seen dysrhythmias or arrhythmias in patients with TOS? Not notably. Uh, you know, again, I, I've not seen that. I've the, but what we have seen is, I think when when sometimes when that artery is getting compressed, I'm thinking of one individual that had when when we raised her arm, um, it, 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 she would and and occluded compressed the nerve and occluded her artery, um, she got very centralized symptoms. She, she, she got dizzy. She was going to fall down. She felt her heart racing, all these kinds of things. Um, there were some very centralized symptoms, right? I've not had somebody that, that you know, and, may, and maybe in an individual that's vulnerable to, um, it, when you have that compression or that irritation, that you can trigger that, um, you know, I think you can draw a line between the two. That said, we don't see that. Uh, um, okay. In, I'm in not, the as for the question, I'm not familiar in the literature with there being a strong association there. How about lower extremity symptoms of any sort? Have you seen those in your TOS patients? Not usually, other than, you know, in some, in some subpopulation of the TOS patients, meaning that they're vulnerable to uh, compression neuropathies, um, for instance, diabetic population um, may be vulnerable to having lower extremity compressions as well. Um, okay. There's lots of studies out there uh, showing that, um, you know, lower extremity, what we would say, diabetic peripheral neuropathy with overlying compression neuropathies, um, these patient, uh, this patient population is also vulnerable to having, you know, post-surgical um, neuralgias and neuromas and uh, and would be more vulnerable to uh, having things like uh, neurogenic vasculitis. Um, I'm a believer. I can tell you that one of our local docs who recently retired, a Dr. Newkirk, um, he did believe that there were lots of patients, lots, relatively lots, but there were patients a decent amount who had lower extremity symptoms. And he believes that it's due to some spinal cord congestion. And it's a question that's not answered yet, but um, I work with a few docs who believe that the veins get compressed and then it alters the nerves in the arm. So that may be happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the literature doesn't have a lot on lower extremity symptoms. Thank you for the question. Sue, hi, Sue. Could left upper limb C5 through T1 sensory motor loss after having a CT and RT surgery be TOS? I presume its eyes still have pain, tongueness. Uh, sorry, tingling, numbness, left arm and hand, nerve conduction tests, say altered median nerve function. So I want to remind everybody we can't answer specific medical questions. We can talk about this in generality. Left C5 and T1 sensory motor loss. It would depend after the cardiothoracic surgery. Um, you know, is, that, some... is that carpal tunnel and radial tunnel? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, good. So that fits more into our questions about multiple crush. Um, so, yeah, well, anytime, have... anytime multiple um, compression neuropathies uh, in the distal limb are diagnosed and you, know, you have surgery and, you're, and they're unsuccessful, you, you need to look more proximal. Um, again, especially in the context of was there a mechanism um, of injury uh, that would maybe induce that, like, you know, a fall, a whiplash, a traction injury to to the um, arm and upper extremity, um, some level of repetitive um, uh, working at or above your 
shoulder level or power zone. All those things are things we think about. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Hi, Freya. Are there risks to be aware of when considering surgery for bilateral TOS? I mean, for bilateral TOS, I think you have you know, one. I don't know that anybody would do it at the same time. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they're, they're the same, right? Um, you have one side and you don't do the other side until you, both you and your surgeon and those around you are 100 percent sure that you've had some level of significant benefit. Um, once you once everybody is on on board and, and feels that you've had some significant relief, then I would consider the second side. There are, of course, free of general surgical risks, you know, bleeding, infection. I don't think you're asking about those. Um, each surgeon is going to have different risks because every surgeon has different approaches. Right, Rob? Mm -hmm. and, and Rob's been a student of many of these approaches. Um, his is rather detailed because of his training. He's a peripheral nerve surgeon, right? Um, some surgeons take a look at big picture. I'm taking out a big hunk of that first rib. I'm going to clean out everything. And that's a different kind of risk. Um, in the literature, the specific risks would be a pneumothorax or an air leak because you are close to the top of the lung. That's pretty uncommon. A, what's called a chylothorax, a leak of lymph, which comes up the left side and um, fairly uncommon. I don't see those very often at all. There is some nerve damage. Dr. Agin had mentioned the phrenic nerve, which controls the diaphragm, which controls breathing. So um, most surgeons are very careful around that nerve. If it does get injured, you, you know, you could have several months where your diaphragm is weak. Usually it recovers, right, Rob? Yep. Okay. Um, That's the one I'll spend most time in talking to people about is that, that phrenic nerve. And, you know, in, in our practice, you know, we've done several hundred of these surgeries and we probably have five or less phrenic nerve injuries and, and only two of them have gone on to need something. And I can tell you, we are so, we, we treat that phrenic nerve so carefully. And the two individuals that have had needed something, they were a higher BMI diabetic patient. So I spent a lot of time counseling about that if, if I think the individual falls into that, um, to that um, uh, category. Um, I, I don't know that anybody is more careful with that phrenic nerve than we are, and we still see some level of irritation to that. So, you know, there, there's a, a movie called The Hangover, and there's one scene where they leave um, uh, Galifianakis. What's Galifianakis' his first name? I forget. Very funny guy, but just he always plays weird characters. He's hanging out by this beautiful vintage Mercedes. An old man walks by and says, Wow, that's a beautiful car. He says, Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. And I think about that one, <laughs> think about the phrenic nerve. We're often the, through the whole thing, you know, we, we never even lay a retractor on it. We, when we, we retract it, we put it above the, the tissues above, and then we pull that tissue up and it lifts it up out of the way. We don't even, we don't even touch it. Right. And we constantly know where it is, you know, and we're, especially when you're taking out that anterior scaling yeah. uh, muscle. And, uh, Good. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for the yeah. question. Don't even look at it. Don't even touch it. Don't even look at it. That's going to be in my head. When TOS Unbound asks a question or provides a comment, I expect something good. Our standard is high for you. My approach to treating TOS addresses the full body. I'm not sure if you've heard of postural respiration, but that's the area of study I try to combine with traditional exercises for treatment. So postural respiration. Uh, before you answer this, Rob, I, I will point people to the past talks we've had with Steve Talikowski, who talks about posture and more importantly about breathing. And so TOS Unbound, I'd love to hear more about what you do. Um, reach out to me. Maybe you want to contribute to one of our talks in the future. But Rob, how do you work with your physical therapists and, and address posture and breathing? I, I think these are great points um, from, from TOS Unbound. Um, we work with our physical therapists very, very closely. You know, it's that whole thing. It's the, you know, it's the, we're all so forward. Our posture is so, you know, do it. I look at my, even my own, like, you know, when there's wrinkles in my, you know, my shoulders need to be back. Everything is forward. And when you're, um, when you're forward and, and, and clam down, taking big deep breaths is hard versus 
taking a big deep breath when you have good posture and and um and you guys are the champions of that in the sense of like helping us on the front end trying to obviate surgery and then if we can't avoid surgery how do we get that person back into better posture afterwards because if if you're not part of the team helping us do that like i said earlier sometimes you don't even really realize the benefit of the surgery if in fact um, the, that's not accomplished. That's great. And I think the people with TOS adopt an abnormal posture as well, don't they? They walk, they have a different center of gravity because of that primary rolling the shoulders forward. Yeah. So that's good to us that you address TOS unbound, that you address all that. I think that is an important part of it. And to her point about the, or his or her point about the, um, the, you know, the full body thing, like, you know, people get deconditioned and uh, I couldn't agree more with once you kind of get them, you know, you know, to a certain point uh, with their own upper extremity posture and then start inner, like, how do you, how do you do all other activities and still remain in good functional position? Excellent. Thank you. I find that patients tend to have one side with a weak oblique or poor rib cage expansion. Areas I'm still looking into are inhalation bias, how pelvic tilt affects the rib cage and shoulder. So more of a whole body approach again, I think, if I'm speaking, sorry for somebody else. But uh, I guess you're suggesting that asymmetry uh, is part of this chain where you have abnormal breathing and then you assume abnormal posture, is that fair? Okay, we're gonna juggle now. I'm gonna go back and TOS Unbound Come back to us. Uh, Tams, one, two, one, two. Yes, I have damage to the anterior scaling. Is this Tams who had the car accident? I think so. So um, damage to the anterior scaling that Rob was talking about, you know, is common. And it makes it, um, if it if it stays permanent, if it's not treated, the muscle is just permanently shortened and tight, changes the position of your neck and your first rib and can take up space that the brachial plexus needs. And um, I will say that it's something you mentioned before, Rob, which I forgot to mention, but you talked about a upper predominant TOS. The nerves, all the nerves in the brachial plexus can take variable courses. And we see this on MRI, but the ones that most commonly do so are C5, C6, and the upper trunk. I'll find them going anterior to the anterior scaling or through the center of it. So I just want to point out that this is another variant of TOS. Okay. Uh, TOS Unbound says, yes, thank you. When, uh, when is surgery not necessary? This is good. That's a pretty big, quick question. I love the old saying, it's easy to easier to know when to operate than, than it is to know when not to operate, right? Um, so sometimes you'll be sitting in front of a, a patient with a spectrum of information, and sometimes it's very obvious that uh, you need surgery and or you would benefit from surgery likely. Um, sometimes it's really confusing uh, and you want to help the patient, but you ultimately know you shouldn't do the surgery. Um, um, you know, surgery is not necessary when you resolve your symptoms with conservative modalities, right? But um, if you're 100, no, if your index of suspicion of your working diagnosis being TOS, neurogenic TOS is high, right? And, and all other things have failed, then you're likely uh, going to end up with surgery. I think we've lost your audio, Rob. I said, we're not, you know, it, that's, it's a big, it's a big stroke question, right? So it's, it's not necessary when you've, when you've cured it without it, right? And that's why the stratified approach that you take allows for those decision points at multiple places along the course. We're as proud to get somebody cured or better without surgery as we are with surgery, right? That's great. Um, you know, we, um, we need to be able to show that we can do that. And, and um, it's, it's, it's fun either way to help somebody. So some of those procedures we talked about before, like hydrodissection, can obviate surgery. Mm -hmm. Good physical therapy in some cases can obviate surgery. 
Yeah, as we're seeing these patients earlier and earlier, I think um, those modalities are more meaningful to that patient population. Excellent. All right. And who, ah, this is easy. Who, <laughs> I'm being facetious here. Who is the best type of specialist to see to diagnose TOS? Um, what type of TOS? <laughs> right? Okay. So she says she's seeing an orthopedic surgeon on the 15th. Okay. I'm going to throw in my two cents first because um, I think Rob's going to favor kind of one type of surgery, surgeon. I, I think, first of all, what you all folks are doing here, advocating for yourselves, educating yourselves, asking questions is a big critical part of this. Okay. Any one doctor, don't take that one doctor's word for it. Okay. There are many specialists who see TOS patients. I say this all the time. Historically, it's never been owned by one type of doctor, but the different docs we're learning more and more have very different approaches. Now I'm going to give it back to our peripheral nerve surgeon, Dr. Hagen, to talk about maybe the docs you work with locally and how you refine that diagnosis from index of suspicion all the way to a specific diagnosis. So, I, I mean, I think the, to your point, Scott, there's multiple different um, specialties that end up seeing these patients that, um, that can make that diagnosis. The key is if they say, no, it isn't, uh, you know, are they a person that has seen, uh, you know, a lot of these individuals um, and, and can they really say that? Um, you know, we, so it's, it may be really geographically uh, dependent on, you know, a specialist, like you could go to Scott, he's a radiologist, right? And he's going to diagnose you much better than uh, many other individuals and many other orthopedists, right? Um, you know, we, we see, we see patients, we didn't, the, the misdiagnosis, even in the underneath their umbrella of TOS is pretty high. Um, so what we do is we end up seeing any patient that has a diagnosis of TOS um, if they haven't had an appropriate uh, workup and evaluation. Because we... Venous TOS or true arterial TOS um, in addition to neurogenic. And if we identify those, we'll send them to the vascular surgeon. Absolutely, right? If we think it's neurogenic and um, it's appropriate for us to continue care, we will. So I, it's, that's, I wish I had a better, more definitive answer, but it's about finding the individual that's committed to and, and seeing a lot of these patients. Is that, you think that's fair, Scott? Uh, you said it great in the beginning. Let's start off with the ones who say you don't have TOS. Those better be really experienced people. Okay? There are a lot of docs who don't see TOS. This goes way back to the beginning of your talk. There are docs who don't see it. And if they don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Maybe they just don't see it. Uh, I'll share a funny story from a court case I did years ago. There's a local doc who's very skeptical that TOS exists. And he was an expert witness in this lawsuit. And he got paid a lot of money for doing that. And the attorney who was working with me said to him, so um, I understand you're an expert in TOS. And the guy said, yes. So does this patient have TOS? And he said, nope, absolutely not. He said, do you see a lot of patients with TOS? And the witness says, no, it's very rare. In my 30 years of practice, I've seen one case. And so the attorney looks at him and says, so you're an expert. <laughs> and that, that's the way it works. People like Rob have seen a million cases, <laughs> cases that are clearly TOS, cases that are clearly not, and those arbitrary cases in the middle. Um, there are different docs in every city and different specialties. So I wouldn't focus on the specialty. I would focus on, does the doc have experience? And then when you talk to the doc, is he or she knowledgeable? I mean, you, you folks ask questions that are really good questions. Clearly, you understand what's going on, and you have the resource of Dr. Google. So be prepared. Ask questions. Be nice. Be polite. If the doc doesn't know something, does he or she say, I'm going to have to look that up? Or do they just dismiss you? So part of that is judging if the doc is open-minded, because none of us knows everything. The second thing I'd say is don't worry about the specialty as much as does the doc have TOS experience. And then finally, go to resources like us. Email us. We'll send you a list of docs in your area. We'll send you contact information for how to reach people. Rob, out of curiosity, do you do video consults? Yeah, we do telemedicine. You know, again, bored out of post-COVID era, we've um, learned to utilize telemedicine um, uh, in 
incredibly well. Um, we we have a port, uh, like a, a, an access port on our uh, website and go and kind of fill out a patient inquiry. And then that kind of can help get that set up. Um, um, I actually quite enjoy it. Uh, I've learned to, to we, every Thursday morning, I, I see great. telemedicine visits from across the nation. That is great. So we've got an expert right here who I can tell you is very experienced, very open-minded, very progressive, great person to see for TOS. Same person, my, physi my physiatrist says my ultrasound is describing TOS, but because my EMG, that's an electrodiagnostic test, months ago came back negative, he says it's not. I am so frustrated with the docs in Canada, he is wrong. Um, first of all, EMGs, um, without going into this story in great detail, um, TOS was first described a little bit over 200 years ago, and there was no problem. Some of the most famous names in the history of medicine have researched it at times and published papers. In the 1980s, a guy at the Cleveland Clinic who had a great reputation, was a neurologist. He said, I took a bunch of these patients. I did EMGs. The EMGs were negative. They're faking it. The surgeons seeing these patients are doing it for money. <laughs> and um, it started a dumb conversation in the literature with a guy named David Roos in Colorado, a surgeon with a lot of TOS experience who pioneered a lot of this stuff. And he kept saying to the original neuros neurologist, he said, well, then what's your answer? What do they have? to which there were just crickets. So <laughs> unfortunately what's happened is that neurologist said, I'm gonna set up a new classification. There's arterial TOS, venous TOS, true neurogenic TOS where your EMG is abnormal and you've wasted the muscles in your hand, which by then it's too late probably. And then disputed TOS where you don't have a positive EMG and you don't have the atrophy in your hand. Now, I'm sure Rob will tell you, most docs will tell you when you have a compressive neuropathy, you'd prefer to treat them before they get atrophy of the muscles, right? You don't want to be at the end stage because it's rare to recover. Secondly, EMG for a lot of reasons just doesn't work in TOS. So the fact that it's negative TAMS, forget it. It doesn't matter. If it was positive, maybe it would point you to something like a cubital tunnel syndrome. That's what Dr. Hagen said before. The other thing I'll say is ultrasounds of the arteries can be negative, completely negative, and you still have neurogenic TOS compression of the artery does not equate to pressure of the nerve. It's the basis for Adson's test where he looks, Adson in the 1920s would hold the radial pulse and move your neck and have you take a breath and try to make the pulse go away. But he didn't have ultrasounds, CAT scans, MRIs in the 1920s. Now that test is merely suggestive. In your case, ultrasound is positive, but none of these tests will show specifically what's going on. So clinically, if your doc suspects TOS because you have this broad range of symptoms, then go to see an expert who really knows enough when to say no and when to say yes. That's my two cents. Rob, after all my two cents, you got something to add? We get an electrodiagnostic study on everyone, nearly everyone. We do not use it to diagnose neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. We use it to make sure it's a it's a, a layer to assure us or add to not missing some cervical pathology and downstream compression neuropathy. The only other cases that we're looking when there are when you have a true brachial plexopathy, which is an intrinsic nerve damage. It, it, maybe there's it was so there's so much traction on the on the brachial plexus that it actually shows up on the electrodiagnostic study. That that's an important um, uh, additional information, but most of the time, ninety eight percent of the time, um, we do not use electrodiagnostic study to diagnose neurogenic thoracic outlet. And, and to add to that excellent question, the, the intrinsic brachial plexus thing is an inflammatory disease. Sometimes, what is it, Parson Turner? I've seen like one case of it so far in my career. Very yeah, rare. The spiral. Um, um, right. Yeah. Right. So you get a virus and then you get this neuropathy that's probably mediated by the immune system. Very rare. We consider TOS as extrinsic. The plexus starts out normal, but it's compressed or stretched. And then all these secondary things change. Mm -hmm. But regardless, uh, you don't get an abnormal EMG till late in the disease. Yeah. All right. Jane Kim. Hi, Jane. Why are there so many physicians who oh, do not believe in TOS? 
what can be done to improve awareness among the general medical community. Um, so first of all, TOS is tough to diagnose. It, it is complex. And I'm sure you've seen patients, Rob, who emotionally are just so freaking frustrated, right? And, and that turns doctors off when a patient comes in and they're needy. They're needy because they've been blown off by five or six docs. So those patients, unfortunately, get pushed away and um, harder for them to break through the physician's uh, belief level. But just because you don't believe in it doesn't mean it's not there. It's, that's ridiculous. I've had these discussions with docs before. And sometimes I have to ask them why the brachial plexus is immune to compression. Every other nerve in the body can be compressed. Why can't the brachial plexus? And I usually get the response, something like, oh, you just don't understand. And then they walk away. So um, besides yeah. the story I just mentioned with the disputed TOS, that's a ridiculous non-scientific approach. And I'm just going to say this once. People who say disputed TOS, it's disputed. They're intellectually lazy. If they read just a little bit of the thousands of papers that are out there, they would understand that it's absolutely real. Rob, that's my soapbox. I'm getting down now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right. It's hard. And it, it, it kind of goes across different, you know, we each have stories about, you know, there's a cervical spine surgeon here in, in our town who just doesn't believe in it and, and literally told a patient that, you know, they must, that if surgeons are doing this, they, they must need a new car or something, you know, just literally, um, and has missed and misdiagnosed many individuals, unfortunately. And, uh, that said, he's a very good spine surgeon. He just, um, when he sees a TOS patient, he does a face plant and can't, you know, can't diagnose it and, and doesn't believe that it's there. So we're often dealing with that, whether it's a, you know, not often. I, I think less often are dealing with that, but we're still dealing with that. Um, whether it's a spine surgeon or a neurologist or you know um, a shoulder surgeon, whatever. I, but I think most surgeons these days are open-minded to it. So part of our overall burden is, to your point, how do we get this out more? And you know, the patients that go back to their that have a great experience and go back to their um, um, providers that, uh, either missed that or, um, or just said they didn't believe it, I think is one of the most impactful ways to, to, to spread that back. I think I shared the, um, earlier on the social media I, I've, I've learned mm -hmm. is just incredibly impactful. Um, um, so I, I I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is other than agree with everything. Let's like face it, right now we're getting some we're getting some high end athletes being diagnosed with TOS. That's helpful. Um, people are more influenced by a Kim Kardashian than they are by a Dr. Scott Warden. I don't know if she knows more <laughs> about TOS than I do, but hopefully she's on our side if she does. Um, we, this social awareness, and again, we get people like TOS Unbound. You know, obviously a trained professional who's been seeing TOS for a while. Those kind of people, I find, Rob, sometimes are more aware than physicians. Have you had that experience with physical therapists and other providers? Yeah. I mean, I, the, the physical therapists that we work through, with throughout the area are, are so open-minded, so patient-centric, um, understand nerve. Um, they, they are eager to learn more about it uh, because they're frustrated when they get these patients and they're they hit the wall and nobody's establishing that yeah. diagnosis. Yeah. So, um, you know, the physical therapists that we work with, the chiropractors that we work with, the, you know, the, the, just the spectrum of care providers that, uh, that are hungry to help. Pay. Or the network that we need to, uh, to engage. Yep. Don't let anybody uh, stop you and all of you keep spreading the word help out on social media. It's great. Um, oh, TOS Unbound, that's so kind of you. Love your approach to evaluating professionals, Dr. Scott. Well, again, I'll ask you to reach out to me. I'd love to have a chat with you. Uh, Freya says, my acupuncture is diagnosed, neurologist, sorry, neurologist confirmed, ultrasound showed, vascular surgeon doubts because EMG didn't show much, and bilateral TOS is rare, but wants to do surgery just in case. Okay. Um, I will tell you from the imaging point of view where I'm at least qualified to speak, even when patients come in with unilateral syndrome, unilateral symptoms, or dominant on 
you know, one side is much stronger than the other. Their anatomy is usually bilaterally symmetric, maybe a little different on each side. But if a patient has severe enough anatomy to have compression of the plexus, they'll have something on the other side that's pretty darn close. And in my experience of following up with patients after surgery is they'll do better on that one side that's been operated on, but now they start noticing the other side, either because it's unmasked from the loss of pain on the first side, or they're more active. So it's not rare. Uh, bilateral TOS is not rare in my opinion. Rob, any thought? Just regarding the bilateral TOS? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. I see it. It's probably 10 to 20, maybe 10 to 20% in, in our, our practice. Um, and then, and usually um, the one side's more minor than the other. And um, often the, when we treat the, the worst side, the other side gets a little bit better. I think there's a little bit of a crossover floodgate um, confusion uh, centrally. Um, so we'll try very hard to uh, treat that opposite side with, uh, with physical therapy and, and conservative modalities. But obviously, uh, if the anatomy dictates that, to your point, if there's a, a residual cervical rib band on each side, you know, inside that middle scaling and, and they have anatomic predisposition, we're ultimately going to do surgery on both sides. If your surgeon says, you know, uh, you can drag me kicking and screaming into the OR and I'll do the surgery, um, maybe you want to get a second opinion before you go that way. Just a, just a thought to make the best choice. And, you know, all the patients I speak with, even if they pick a great surgeon like Rob, other people I work with, I usually encourage them to get a second opinion because it's good for your confidence. You did your research. You know how docs think differently. Most of the good TOS docs will say, sure, get a second opinion. Here's how I approach it. I'm glad to talk with you about it. I have, so a, think low, I have a low threshold to encourage people to get a second opinion. Um, if, if, and if your doc is offended by that, you should move on along. Um, you know, I, uh, I encourage, we're all, you're, I, I love the line, you're the, you're the chairperson of your own board of health. We're all just board members sitting at your table, right? And our, our job is to give you the best information that we can. Ultimately, you have to make that decision and, and, and we're part of your team to move forward. I wish I could put that in a promotional commercial. It's a great way to put it. <laughs> yep. It's about you, the patient, not about us. Yeah. yeah. Um, Freya also asks, how will I recognize muscle, muscle atrophy on my own? How will a doctor diagnose atrophy? I think it's better to have a doctor diagnose it. I mean, you may see it, but, you know, a good doc will examine you for strength and reflexes. They'll, if they know what they're looking for, they'll look for differences in the muscles, but it also depends where your disease is you know, that which muscles would be affected. Um, I mean, you can, you can see pictures online of people who have narrowing between the muscles of their hand. That's kind of classic for TOS, but it's pretty rare because it's when the TOS is very advanced. Herb, do we have other questions? Uh, we let people know that Dr. Hagen can be reached at neuropaxclinic.com. That's N-E-U-R-O, neuro. P A X clinic.com. He's a great guy to talk to. He knows so much, very personable as you see here. And um, absolutely a great resource for TOS. I love hearing more about what you're doing, Rob, with your gradient approach and how you work your way into these. And uh, hopefully we get to work together a lot more because it's uh, really stimulating for me. Well, I, I love every one of our discussions. I'm grateful and I'm honored to have been invited on uh, to this um, and uh, and discuss with you and and for for all the folks out there, I'm I'm truly grateful. Thanks. We're gonna we're gonna put you up on YouTube and on our web pages. Uh, save you for posterity. You really add to the richness of our <laughs> our resources for patients. I really appreciate it. All right, and then uh, I'll remind people that is thoracic outlet syndrome rare. That's one of my talks coming up on September 13. We'll be having Dr. Vernon Williams again soon from Cedar Sinai. I'll find the exact schedule for that. And I think we're working on Dr. Art Jenkins from New York. All people like Dr. Hagen, really smart, really smart. They scare me and um, really good with TOS. So good talks coming up. Please hit the subscribe button. Please mash like. I think that's what they say on YouTube. Help us out. 
go to our other um, social media like Instagram and Facebook and uh, Twitter, TOSMRI. You can find us on all of those. I'm trying to post more blog posts and trying to um, get a little more active on Twitter, which I've never done before. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. I thank everybody who's attending and asking good questions. And until next time, I'm the TOS guy, Dr. Scott Warden. Thank you so much. All right. Rob, see you soon. Cheers. Thank you.